I am truly delighted to welcome all of you to today's Holocaust Living History Workshop, featuring the distinguished historian Federico Finkelstein. This workshop is not only the first in 2023, but it is also the first since the start of the pandemic, uh, three years ago almost, uh, to be held in our usual location, which as I was uh, saying to some people, it feels uh, a bit weird, but good, right? <laughs> it's really nice to see so many of our regular guests here and also many new faces. Today's event is generously sponsored by Ms. Uh, Julie Tepper-Galper. Julie began attending our workshops several years ago and has been an enthusiastic and generous supporter whose dedication to, the Hol to Holocaust education has been an inspiration to us all. On behalf of the Holocaust workshop, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to her. She has... She has chosen to make this event possible in memory and honor of her mother, Rachel Tepper. Rachel was originally from Romania and was the only person of her entire family to survive the Holocaust due to her uh, timely escape to Peru. Before I provide some technical details for audience participation, I would also like to acknowledge the UC San Diego Library and the Jewish Studies Program for their ongoing support of the workshop. And now it is my pleasure to ask Peter Gurevich to the podium. Peter is the founding dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy, serving from 1986 to 1998. He is an expert on international relations and comparative politics, and the author of a forthcoming book of his family's escape from Nazi-occupied Europe. Please join me in welcoming Peter Gurevich. I'm not sure that one is still yet allowed to shake hands or anything in these days, but it's uh, my pleasure uh, to be here and to uh, introduce our speaker uh, um, tonight. He, uh, I think you know some of the basic facts. He is a professor at the New School for Social Research in New York. He began his education in Argentina, and then he got a master's and PhD in history from Cornell University and he taught at Brown for a while, which makes me very happy because I have one child who went to Brown and another child who's now a professor at Brown. So um, he has a very impressive record of publication on fascism. You should look it up. It's really quite extraordinary, and it's not only historical from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, but it takes us into the present time. It's very appropriate for this evening's lecture because it makes the very difficult framework of staying in the period and not violating in the sense of trying to understand then, but it also does something that I'm sure all of us are doing, which is making comparisons to what is going on t today. Uh, just to mention some of the books that he's published, A Brief History of Fascist Lies at the University of California Press is a particularly wonderfully appropriate thing because we are all very struck by they tell these lies and how do they get away with it? Don't, doesn't everybody know that they're lies? And so an exploration of uh, what is going on there, how do they get away with it, is interesting. And from fascist, uh, the newest book, or one of the newest, I don't know what is the newest book because there are so many of them, Fascist Mythologies, History and Politics of Unreason in Borges, Freud, and Schmidt at Columbia in 2022, which sounds quite remarkable. There's also uh, an extraordinary list of translations uh, of the languages that many of these books have been published into, so it's a very impressive record. And so it is impressively well prepared to plunge into the difficult debates today. Uh, and I think what's interesting is precisely this point that I alluded to is, how do you talk about something that on the one hand we think of as the past from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and on the other hand there's a constant reference to this, to today, and so how do you remain true to your commitment as a historian, which is to make descriptions to the past, and yet, on the, on the other hand, m try to make sense out of the reference to it today, to today. And I think that there's another element of it that I feel particularly attached to, which is how do you compare one country to another? I, I professionally, in my field, I'm a comparativist. That is, I, I have one country in particular that I have done a lot of work on, which is France. But I've always, even France, I always thought of in comparative terms. I've, I've never 
liked the idea of France as a civilization. We're describing the civilization. I don't think you can make sense out of any one country if you don't try to relate it to others and try to think about what's similar and different. And I think that, that our speaker today has a very deep sense of that in the things that I've read of his that are like that, that on the one hand, he wants to locate it. On the other hand, he wants to make the comparisons. And I think that's exactly, exactly what we need. Uh, I think in one of the themes he has, he talks a lot about ideology. And I'm really looking forward to what he has to say about that today. I, I'd like to hear him explain what is it, does he mean it as an ideology? Is he using it as an explanation of what people are doing? Or is he using it descriptively as a way of, of describing their kinds of behavior? In which case, then I wonder, well, why, why do they have this ideology? They believe these things which we know are false. So then makes us wonder, well, why do they believe them? What, what explanation? Can we, can we have an explanation of why people believe false things? Or are we only in a situation of describing that they do believe false things? I think this is very difficult. I think people are not sure about how we have an explanation of why people believe false things. I think one of the difficult things about in the comparisons, problem of comparison, I think one of his biggest problems is, in the problem of comparisons is, there are always, whenever you compare, there are always exceptions and, f and false comparisons. Uh, for example, in fascism and Hitler, uh, obviously Germany at that time is one of the classic locations of it. But how generic is that and how generic is Hitler for the most conspicuous part of his fascism, which he was a complete lunatic maniac. I think Joel Dimsdale, having written a book on that, would agree that that guy was a maniac. I don't know what criteria you would use, but I say he's a maniac. <laughs> Whatever criteria you were going to use, he's a maniac. Somebody who goes around and wants to kill that many people is just a maniac. And so does that mean that fascists are people who want to kill Jews? Well, I would say no, I don't think it is. I think there are plenty of places around the world which we would call fascists for many reasons, and most of them do not want to go around killing Jews. So if we define fascism, which I think I hear many people do this, fascism is a characteristic. The definition of fascism is people who want to kill Jews. I think this is not a good method. And I'm very struck by this, and fre frequently we see this happening with um, Ukraine. When I hear people say, people criticize Putin, they have many things to criticize Putin about, but when they hear Putin say that, that Ukraine is controlled by fascists and they wish to reject that proof, the way they reject that proof is by saying it couldn't possibly be controlled by fascists because Zelensky, the president, is Jewish and therefore, since he's the president, it couldn't be controlled by fascists. I'm sorry, as a historian, this makes me very upset. I have to turn down the television and walk around the room to calm myself down. Because the fact that they've elected Zelensky does not do anything for us because fascism is not to be equated with simply being anti-Semitic. They could easily have elected Z Zelensky and be run by fascists. It's not, a, it's not a proof. And so I think that the, once we start realizing that it's more complicated, it helps us to understand the questions that many of us are asking. Well, who is a fascist? Is Trump a fascist? Bolsonaro? Orban? Which of these people that we hear a lot about? Putin himself. Many people are saying, you know, the real fascist out here is the guy who's calling the kettle black. It's Putin's the fascist out there. This is what Snyder, that the authority at Yale, is saying. Many people are saying that. So there's an interesting discussion to be had about those kinds of things, and, and important ones. And I think there are, we're very fortunate tonight that there are very few people around in this world who are writing who are as qualified and prepared and have worked so seriously on these things as Frederico Finkelstein, and I'm sure I mispronounced your name, though we discussed it for 10 minutes, how properly to pronounce it, but that's not going to protect me. Uh, but he is, I think, one of the leaders internationally in what I would call comparative fascist studies. So I'm very eager to hear his thoughts on this topic. And so join me in welcome Frederico Finkelstein and a terrific topic of what's fascism got to do with it, the ideological origins of the Holocaust. Frederico. Thank you very much for this very generous uh, presentation. I mean, uh, I would also 
uh, like uh, to thank Julie Tepergalper for having uh, facilitated the, this meeting and, and her support for this workshop. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be, to be here and as, as Professor Gurevich was sa saying uh, and also Susan Hillman who I also would like to thank for having invited me. Uh, we don't do these things much, at least me. Like I haven't been in another American university for a couple of many months, I would say, perhaps half a year. Uh, and, and there is this tendency to do only Zoom, which I think is very problematic. I don't know why. It might be the way we are wired or the way many of us are wired, but I don't learn as much. Like even when I talk, I don't learn as much. And, and uh, so, I mean, being here is, is really rewarding, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the Q&A. Of course, uh, I'm from Argentina, and we talk a lot. So that goes against what I just said, because I would have also to restrain myself. I could talk for three hours without even planning it. Uh, so there are two, there is a tension there that I, we will try to resolve. Um, the question, of course, I mean, Professor Gurevich was asking the questions that all of us are asking, and, and we try to arrive, uh, in our cases, from our fields of expertise, because, of course, everybody is asking what's going on. And, and the second, or the related question to that is what is new about it? And of course, this is a question that many of the current, uh, you know, uh, I would say, the, I don't want to enter the fascism debate that, you know, with, with a, in, a, in such an explicit way, but I will. Okay, so what people that are related to the history of fascism, people like Bolsonaro and or Trump, claim to be totally new. In fact, the, the former president of the U.S. called our present time the age of Trump. I mean, this is, of course, uh, a, a symptom of, uh, of his narcissism. But, uh, but on the other hand, we should ask how, much, how, how true it is that, that this is new. And of course, in history, history is a continuity, uh, but also change. So an historian will try to see the I mean, the different angles of the question. So to claim that something is entirely new is just propaganda. I mean, that's what these people do. Uh, they are good at it. Uh, to claim that something is uh, no new at all is not, a, history, is not a, a historical view because, again, there are connections with the past. In fact, that's why most of us historians are historians. We don't collect facts from the past. We are not antiquarians, but we want to understand the present. I mean, my drive to do history is the present. And at different presents, we ask different questions to the past. That's, that's what we do. And, and, and I will, a little bit later, talk about this, because this is a way to understand why these issues that we are talking about today, which is fascism and the Holocaust, were not necessarily connected for so many years, perhaps even the entire 20th century. Most people working on these two fields of knowledge the research and study of the Holocaust, the research and study of fascism, they were not connecting the dots. Not only that, they were rejecting that sort of connection. So at that time, there were different problems and they had their reasons for not asking those questions or even rejecting those questions. I will come back to, to this. So in order to understand what happened, we need to understand also our present in the sense that these are the questions that we are asking. And this is why we ask them. Um, regarding uh, fascism, the question of the Holocaust is also central because it kind of, in my opinion anyway, it puts fascism in, in the place it deserves. Because once you connect fascism to the Holocaust, you cannot, you cannot take this uh, uh, very problematic view, which is, you know, listening to the two sides or this both sideism, that, you know, that there are good things uh, or bad things about one problem. Or as the former president of the U.S. said, even among Nazis there are uh, fine people. Um, so this is, of course, extremely problematic. And looking at the Holocaust in its connection to fascism, I think, already provides a correction to this really problematic view. A view that not only enables the, the attacks against democracy in the present, but also leads us or mis misleads us to, uh, I mean, to see the past in, in ways that do not correspond to what happened, basically. Um, so the question is not really whether, uh, of course, fascism is, is good or bad, but the question is, and it was throughout the years, in terms of this relationship between fascism and the Holocaust, uh, is fascism how bad it was. And once you, of course, connected with the Holocaust, it would have been difficult to say that it wasn't really bad. So that's, that's why, you know, these questions 
had an impact in that sense. Uh, this, in, in fact, created, and for different reasons, different uh, politicians, but also, sadly, historians, were engaged in this myth of a benign form of fascism vis-a-vis -vis Nazism. Because, of course, if you are not like the Nazis, you have to be better. I mean, the Nazis being the, you know, the most, and, and it's true, the most extreme example of uh, uh, extreme right politics, which is to say, you know, to a great extent, fascism. That is not a definition of fascism, but fascism certainly is that. Um, and this is the, the, this is the context in which, again and again, the question of, of fascism and the Holocaust uh, comes to the fore, and, and it was answered, and it will be answered, certainly in different ways, uh, you know, uh, uh, as contexts are uh, changing as well. Of course, in our current context, the question is certainly way more important than, than it was before. And in a way, we are way more connected in asking these questions, what is the future of our democracy? Are we going to be, uh, you know, suffering uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, diversity and pluralism? And these questions kind of bypass the many decades that we live and our parents live before and connects us to the 1930s and 1940s. So, I mean, in a way, it's very organic that we connect to those times. And in fact, we know that uh, uh, the general that was like uh, the most impor important uh, 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 military person in America at the time, when he saw the events of January 6, he thought about those times. And that is not a lack of context. That I don't think that is a ahistorical view. I mean, and again, as Professor Gurevich was saying, the question is how you make the connection. If it's, if, it's, if it's a way to see parallels is one thing. If it's a total conflation between past and present, then it's be, it becomes problematic. I mean, and then by the, by on the other hand, you see even historians, uh, some of them very famous, saying, well, this is not like the Nazis because, and this is a kind of, I will simplify it, because this guy doesn't have Hitler's mustache, or it's not Hitler. <laughs> or, I mean, I, nobody says about the mustache, but the idea is that this is not Hitler. Well, of course it's not Hitler. Hitler was Hitler, and this guy is someone else. Uh, but the connections are there. The question is how similar, how uh, different, how much continuity, how much uh, change. So, because in fact, what, what is going on in the present and what, is, what went on in the past, this is part of the same history. And you can call this history the history of fascism, if you want. You can call this history the history of xenophobia, if you want. Or you can call it the history of those that are against democracy. And, and again, or against liberal democracy or constitutional democracy. And then you see the connections, if you want to see them. Uh, but this is not a question of you know, the will to see them, but rather to focus our study or to focus our analysis in those uh, connections in those connections. So this is not about the uniqueness of the past or fascism or the Holocaust, but about these uh, global connections. Now, I will switch uh, now to, to, to two dimensions of this issue of, uh, of fascism and the Holocaust. Before all that, because you might be wondering, and there are many definitions out there, I mean, what is fascism? I mean, that could be, I could talk for hours on that. Uh, and I would be also not very satisfied because it's a difficult question to, to answer and yet, Many of my works, I try to answer that question by taking different, by problematizing it. I mean, to say, okay, this is very difficult to explain, but we can understand it better by, by, by seeing all these angles. And yet, in, in the book I'm writing, I'm supposed to deliver the final draft in a few months. Uh, I really force myself to, to focus on four things that fascism was about. Fascism was many things, but these four things, other Poli uh, political ideologies or movements or regimes did not have in the same way. I was asking this question to, you know, to, to fascism because then, I mean, I published this book a couple of years ago, which is From Fascism to Populism in History. And what I say in this book is that after 1945, uh, people that were fascists, at least many of them, not most of them, the ones that still like Hitler and Mussolini and they wanted to continue that project in the same way, uh, we call them neo-Nazis, neo-fascists. They were a political minority until recently and, and they were never successful in politics until recently. So the people that were uh, smarter or more pragmatic among them changed. So the ones that remain like that never achieved power. They always were like a, a, a poli uh, you know, political opposition and so on. Um, and that's another history. But the history of populism is the history, at least in its beginnings, 
of people that used to be authoritarian fellow travelers of fascism or even fascists and decided after 1945 that it was time to change. Whether they meant it, they felt it, or they wanted to be in power, that's a, qu and a difficult question to answer. Like Eric Hosson, this famous historian of the 19th and 20th century, said, well, with the, with the advent of mass politics, once we have mass politics, we will never know again, even when we study a politician as a source, what they truly think. And it's impossible to know. Uh, but we know what they do. And what they did is uh, basically what I say, what I call a reformulation of, of fascism in democratic, uh, in, in, a, in a democratic key. The result was populism, which was this authoritarian take on democracy. And yet it was this combination that made them differently to fascists. And in fact, in this analysis that they did, uh, they did the opposite of what the fascists did. The first cases were in my country, in Argentina, but also in, in Brazil, uh, in Argentina with Juan Domingo Perón, in Brazil with Getulio Vargas, and many others, first in Latin America, then in other places. Uh, for the Q&A, if you ask me why Latin America, I can engage with that, uh, because I have, you know, I have asked myself that question and I try to answer it in my book. Uh, but the fact is that they did the opposite of what the fascists do. What do the fascists do in the most famous cases, Italy and Germany? They use democracy to destroy it from within. Once they arrive, to power through, you know, through democratic means, they destroy democracy from within. The history of Perón, the first of these populist leaders, is different because Perón was a dictator. He was a strong man in a dictatorship, the dictatorship, the Argentine dictatorship that started in 1943, and he did the opposite. He destroyed that dictatorship from within to create a democracy. He called for elections and was elected. And in fact, the legacy, I mean, he saw fascist politics as toxic. In, the, in, 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 you know, in those terms. And all these people from Perón to, or, or Vargas to Berlusconi or Cristina Kirchner or Hugo Chavez or whoever you want, including this mix of populists, eventually left and right, they, they did not engage with these four elements, what I call the four pillars of fascism, which are, and I will, I will say this very briefly, but we can engage with this later. Number one, violence and the militarization of politics. This was Central to this was central to fascism, and in populism, this is not central. Violence doesn't produce many voters, they thought, perhaps they were wrong or not, acting, you know, like faking that you are a soldier, you know, dressing as a pseudo soldier with this toy, using guns as a kind of toy, using pseudo uniforms, basically paramilitary uh, formations. That was a thing of the past. Nobody will dress, you know, a march like in, in, in populist regimes with guns like this, playing to be a soldier and so on, uh, helmets and all this paraphernalia. I mean, because that was not cool, I mean, for politics. It was regarded as, okay, Perón said, using a, an Argentine slang that, that someone in the audience might, might understand, is like he called them pianta votos, which means these kind of things scare voters. I mean, if you have guys which are dressed as soldiers, but they are not part of the military and they are threatening you with their weapons, well, some people might say, this is very problematic. We don't want them close. That's what they used to say in the 20th century. Of course, now, different situation. So one, violence and the militarization of politics. This idea that politics is about, you know, being at war. Uh, second, central, dictatorship. These people, this, you know, believe in elections. They were authoritarian, but that was an essential element in their, uh, you know, in their regimes. Uh, so number three, lies, and this is, uh, you know, I'm, I was very concerned about this, about this issue, so I wrote a book about it, this brief history of fascist lies, and I will give you an example from the Holocaust to understand what is the difference between this particular way of fascist lying and lies in general. I mean, Hannah Arendt, uh, uh, you know, a very important philosopher, said, well, since Ancient times, politicians lie. I mean, it's related to the work of politics. And that is, I'm not criticizing this, but let's say, let's be more diplomatic. They exaggerate what they will do or what they are doing. Uh, but fascists lie in a different way because fascists believe in their lies. This is a major difference. But not only they believe in their lies, but they wanted to change the world in order for the world to, be, to become what the lies are saying. To change reality in order for reality to be like the lies. And of course, this is extremely dangerous. I will tell you an example. Nazis, of course, said that Jews uh, were uh, dirty and spread disease. 
is a huge lie. I mean, cannot, I, it infuriates me just to say this. I mean, it's as, as, as a, I mean, it's such a lie that it doesn't even need to be uh, explained. And what did they do with this lie? I mean, of course, many, you know, particularly Jews didn't believe that. Uh, but what the Nazis did with this lie? So they put Jews in uh, ghettos and concentration camps, horrible sanitary conditions. These people, these poor people, the victims of the Nazis, the Jews, became dirty and spread disease. And, and the Nazis will say, you see, I was telling the truth. Now, that's my question in this book. That is not the truth. The truth then becomes a propaganda converted into reality. That's what the truth is for them. So anyway, that's what I deal with this in this book. I mean, by incidentally, I start with a quote from the former president of the US, um, what, a couple of quotes, uh, and in which Donald J. Trump says, what you are seeing and what you are reading is not what's happening. So that's uh, the kernel of this way of thinking, right? Okay, what I'm seeing is not what's happening. No, you trust the leader that reality is not what you see. Uh, and, and eventually people were killed in the past because of this kind of uh, approach to politics. The last, uh, the last element, so I just was saying four elements of fascism, four pillars of what fascism is and populism was not until recently, violence, dictatorship, lies, and last, number four, politics of extreme xenophobia, which includes in many cases anti-Semitism, but as Professor Gurevich was uh, explaining, not, not always. But this radical hatred for the other, for diversity, which often, uh, if not in all cases, includes forms of racism, is central to a fascist movement. Uh, now, these are elements that combine, of course, what fascism is in, in, and was and has been in so many countries, from China to Japan to Argentina to Brazil to India to Germany and Italy. And yet, and of course this connects, you know, then uh, fascism to what happened in the Holocaust. And yet these questions or these connections were not made. Um, so now I would like to talk about two dimensions of this problem. One is historiography, the other one is history, basically. I mean, this, uh, I will make this distinction in order to first deal with historians and then with their sources, meaning people that lived during the period. We call them sources, but that's a, just a term to explain, I mean, or to see, or another, another one will be testimonies, meaning things that happened in the past that allow us to, under, or people that, things that happened to people or were said by people that allow us to understand uh, the past. So the first part is historians and their interpretation of the past. Now, in terms of the historiographies of fascism, I would say, if I have to generalize, there were four different moments until, you know, from after 45 to the present in which historians approach the issue of fascism. The first, the early moments was uh, a very strong and under understandably so anti-fascist view that explained fascism in ways that did not, uh, I mean, it's, it was super global, if you will, but it did not understand the particular national distinctions of all these movements. Uh, and how, in fact, you know, there were sometimes integration among them, but also disputes, of course. Because imagine the fascist international. It's international of, of people that are as radically nationalist as it can be. So at one point there is a problem. Everybody wants to be number one. Um, so basically anti-fascists then regarded fascism as, an, as a kind of such a global phenomenon that, that it was not necessarily to understand national histories. And after this, there was a reaction. And historians stress, uh, started to stress national histories. And the problem with this is emphasizing all these distinctions with the global dimension of the phenomenon is that the connections were lost. And then fascism was, in the most radical cases of this approach, it was only in fascist Italy, you have fascism. That's the way they were called, that's it. And, and, then, um, and then after this, like in the 90, probably late 1980s, uh, and the 1990s, there were another bunch of historians that reacted against that. And, and they called themselves generic historians of fascism. And they talk again, they wanted to recuperate the earlier versions in meaning that fascism is a more generic notion. And once again, a specificity, I mean, a spe particular a, a specificities were lost. Now, these, these historians started to include the Holocaust as part of the, uh, their explanation, but 
in a problematic way, in a way that did not uh, understand the particular distinctions, because at the end of the day, fascism in Italy was not Nazism in Germany. Um, and at the time, uh, all these debates happened at, in all these different times, the first period of anti-fascism, the second period of national histories, the third period of generic fascism, in different places. Throughout the world, different historians of fascism were addressing uh, these, uh, these uh, dimensions. And the last, I mean, uh, uh, the, last, the last period I will call, or the last shift or the last turn, I will call it transnational history of, of fascism. Meaning historians, uh, well, I, I, I include myself within this group, historians that uh, study national histories but also transnational connections. So yes, they were different but also they were connected. It sounds obvious, right? And, it, and yet it took probably since 1945 to the early 2000s for people to start working this way. Perhaps, and I'm not able at this point to analyze why and how this was the case, but to me, when I started asking the questions in my PhD, it became, like I couldn't understand why they were not asking the questions before. Perhaps there were different contexts which were different to the ones I was living in. And uh, among these transnational histories, I would like to mention here in passing works by Reto Hoffman on, on, on Japanese fascism, Maggie Clinton on fascism in China, Ben Zakaria, on in, in fascism in India. Um, now, if we uh, switch, uh, by the way, the last period is the moment when we start asking the question of how, because everything is connected, although everything is also different, then why and how the Holocaust is connected to the story? Because once we understand the Holocaust, uh, of course, as a, a trigger started and, of course, authored by the Nazis, but also an event, and we know more because there are more national histories on this, in which local fascists play an important role in different countries in collaborating with this pan-European uh, project. So the more we see the, the distinctions, but also the connections, which are transnational, the more, the more we understand uh, the connections between fascism and the Holocaust. In terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of previous approaches, uh, uh, my general take on them, and I would like to be very polite, uh, is that it's not that they are wrong, but they are not historical enough. And, and I think we need to do more history here and to, in order to see these, uh, these connections. Um, I think, you know, in terms of now, if we switch from historians and, and fascism to historians and the Holocaust, we see not exactly the same kind of stages, but we see uh, similar trends. After 1945, there were different, basically, I will now generalize and say, Mainly two different groups studied the Holocaust, uh, in, you know, after the Holocaust. I mean, many of them were German historians or historians of German history on one side, and then uh, historians of Jewish history and Jewish studies on the other side. And, and their focus was extremely different. Whereas the first group tended to see how it worked, uh, generally historians working in the fields of Jewish history and Jewish studies will ask the question of why it happened. Very different, you know, very different uh, questions to be asked. And again, at one point, like it was a debate among them. Like, is it better to ask the how? Is it better to ask the why? The why? It lasted many decades. I mean, it's kind of surprising. I mean, because why not asking the two questions at once? And that's what we do. Like we read all these historians and we try to integrate their approaches um, in order to know more. Of course. Now, let me say that I was generalizing. Every, even a person asking the why will emphasize that dimension rather than the how, and the opposite will happen with someone emphasizing the how. It's not that they were absolute, absolutist about this, but, and yet these were the two, the two dimensions. Uh, the majority of them, for different reasons, will not include fascism as part of the analysis. In terms of Jewish history and Jewish studies, the problem of including fascism was uh, as Saul Friedlander and other historians ex, uh, explain, was that it kind of, or it could be perceived, or it, or it was done uh, in a way that, that uh, downplayed the uniqueness of the Holocaust and the particularity of the experiences of the victims. So that was their concern. Uh, and it was, I think, a very fair concern insofar as many of these histories actually did that. They don't play these experiences. Uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that that, that, that has to be the case. Uh, I will return to this in a, in a second. 
Among Germans historian, German historians or historians of German history, there was another problem. I mean, also good reasons, but another problem, which is the more you de-emphasize the importance of German history, by including Italy and including other countries, perhaps the more you are suggesting that Nazism was not that bad after all if everybody was doing it. I mean, that was the, 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 the so they needed to emphasize only German history because if you include the, Itali Itali the Italian fascists, then somehow you are downplaying the negativity of Nazism. So that was the concern, again, an important concern. Um, so in fact, both of these, uh, these fields, they were concerned about a historical approach to this issue. And fascism, in a way, sometimes was the vehicle in which these ahistorical views, non-historical views, not, in, not contextual enough views uh, were, uh, were used to, uh, to downplay the, the particularities of the event. Now, of course, you know, there is the Holocaust is unique, but so, other, so are other events. So the question is with respect, trying to analyze the connections, as I said before, but also the differences. Um, the, the idea, I mean, the, the idea of downplaying especially the, the, the experience of the victims was not necessarily exclusive uh, of uh, historians working on German history. In fact, the author of the most important work, in my opinion, still is on the, on the history of the Holocaust, Raoul Hilbert, who authored this magnus, magnum opus, uh, The Destruction of the European Jews, downplayed the experience of the victims. He believed, actually, was Jewish. He had, like, uh, many members of his family died in the Holocaust, but he saw that, that somehow by studying the perpetrators, what could be more objective, and somehow victims in their testimonies were, he said, more biased. I mean, of course, this is extremely problematic. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I wrote uh, an article criticizing this uh, dimension, which, of course, he didn't like. Um, but, but again, like, this happens in, 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 and again, and yet things have changed also in the field of Holocaust studies and Jewish studies and, and, German, and German history. I will just mention that there is way more interest uh, in the last, let's say, I will say uh, two decades on comparative genocide, which again, it doesn't mean equalizing everything, but seeing the connections, because there are many connections. You have this genocide, you have the other, this other, and there are many connections. And sometimes these connections are actually historical such as, for example, the, the experience of the, uh, the Herero genocide by the Germans in Namibia. This happened some, some time before the Nazis came to power, but also acted as a precedent to this. Um, and here I would like to mention the work of historian Jürgen Siebener and, uh, and, and Isabel Hall, for example, in which they analyze the connections, but also at some point they say, okay, but there are limits to this. Now, when I started teaching at the New School in New York, this was in 2006, I was asked by, by the dean at the time of the college to teach a history of the Holocaust. And, and I included, like, the, it started with Namibia. And some, some, uh, you know, some people were shocked, but this is part of this history, and it doesn't mean that it's the same. It means that it's a precedent. Um, and then we have now studies on, uh, on issues related to trauma, um, history of sexuality, global history here. I would like to mention the work of Dear Moses, Amos Goldberg, Simon Levy Sulam, Dan Stone, Jennifer Evans. And of course, we, many of us are going back to the work of Hannah Arendt, uh, who signaled these connections, sometimes in problematic ways, but she was not exclusively interested in, you know, the, this event as not, connecting to, not connected to anything else. Um, in my own work, and I mentioned this in passing, uh, I, I was, of course, dealing with this issue in terms of the history of populism, but then I have another book which I wrote on the Argentine Dirty War. I was a young kid at that time, and, and I was concerned about antisemitism and the particular dimension, which I, I find it difficult to explain, that Jews were and are, and are now in Argentina, my, my community, I, I'm, I'm Jewish and Argentine as well, uh, uh, or I'm an Argentine Jew, uh, they were less and are less than 1% of the population and between 10 and 15% of people killed by the Argentine dictatorship in the 70s were Jewish. So I wanted to know why is this the case? I mean, what is the place of this? And one particular dimension, which is not the only one, is what I call these transhistorical histories of, of traumatic encounters, transhistorical histories of trauma, because one weird dimension, to use another word, which is not that great, but explains the, 
the, the, the kind of uncanny dimension of these events is that Jewish victims were tortured in Argentine concentration camps by people that told them that they were doing what Hitler did in Auschwitz or in, the, you know, or in other places. So in, in fact, this was not the same. These were not two, you know, these, these were two histories, two contexts, and two different continents. And yet the, the, these histories were collapsing to what I call this kind of trans uh, historical memories of perpetrators that they are inspired by, you know, by the Nazis, for example, by not being exactly what, what the Nazis did, but the Na sometimes these events also are inspiration or provide an inspiration for perpetrators out there. And this is these connections we need to study as well. Some of ta sometimes also the Nazis themselves establish these connections. We should remember that, uh, 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 you know, Eichmann, when he was uh, who was living in my country, in Argentina, uh, he was asked uh, if he wanted to say something before uh, his execution in Israel. And Hannah Ar Arendt said, well, he chose to be a cliché. Because he said, yes, my last words. And he, he said, like, uh, I don't remember the order, but he said, long live Austria, Argentina, and Germany. And um, so he, I mean, my point is that like he meant it. He, see, he saw connections between the Argentine fascist experiences and the experience he had lived an author, you know, some years before. Uh, and I think there is a movie that, that really gets, you know, many dimensions of this uh, about the Eichmann kidnapping. It's a, it's a really good movie. In the Q&A, I can explain also some dimensions of it because uh, anyway, I could. So I, now I would like to turn to the victims. Uh, and, and, and in a way, they provide us with another reason why we should focus on these connections between fascism and the Holocaust. Because these distinctions, in fact, happen, started to happen more and more after 1945 for reasons which were not connected to the context of fascism at the time. What I mean by this is that in so many testimonies from the period, from Jewish victims, we see that they are talking about Nazis and fascism as if these are the same thing. Because they understood Nazism to be a case a radical example of a broader uh, fascist situation. But this is not, or this should not be shocking. I mean, if people were in Romania or Hungary, they will see they are local fascists and also they will know the Nazis. And in fact, this is, for example, we can see this in, 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 you know, in, in the writings of Chaim Kaplan in the Warsaw Ghetto. He's talking about the Nazis, he's talking about fascism in, in, in a more global way. Uh, another key victim, that, I mean, in terms of what he left us, which is the, this very important work to understand what happened, uh, Jana Marie, he said he wrote about real fascism and singular Nazism. And finally, I would like to, perhaps even I could read a little bit, if, you know, uh, from Primo Levi, I mean, to, because Primo Levi, you know, this... Uh, this uh, survivor of the Holocaust that left us with this incredible work of interpretation is a memory, yes, but he's also allowing us to understand what happened. It's like, I mean, for us historians, it's, it's an incredible, incredible situation to, to have the privilege of such a, such a thinker, you know, in a way trying to analyze things as, the, as they happen in ways that we cannot, for sure. Uh, and he said, uh, well, he said, Nazism was the German version of fascism. And, and he went even, uh, you know, uh, he even said that, and I read, the black shirts, the fascists, had, just not, uh, had not just killed Turin's trade unionists, communists and socialists. First, they, they made them drink half a kilo of castor oil. In this way, a man is reduced to tatters, is no longer human. So he sees this dehumanization, which is central to every fascist project, political project, uh, as happening in 1922 in Italy. So he sees these connections and he says, I mean, actually, the explicit, he says, there is a direct connection between the Turin massacres of 1922 and the entry ceremony in the Nazi camps, which he lived, by the way, I add, where they strip, destroy your personal photographs, shave your head, tattoo you on the arm. And he, uh, he concluded, this was the demolition of man. And he's talking about the Holocaust, but he goes on, this is fascism. And I think we need to return to these words in order to, to further analyze them. And I would like now to finish with a question from my grandfather, uh, which is, of course, you know, uh, in terms of the history of Judaism, it's a more, many, many times millenary question. 
And with my, my father, my grandfather, Mauricio uh, Mayer, Mayer uh, he always asked me because he knew, you know, by the end of his life that I was pretty interested in, in this stuff and I was trying to, to study it, to analyze it. And different things that I was telling him, he would always ask, and is it good for the Jews? <laughs> and I think this question is really, really important because what it means, it's not a narcissistic question. It's, it means, are we in danger? And what it means is, are minorities and pluralism in danger? And this is the question. I mean, this is the question. We are a minority. Are we in danger? Meaning, is this against, for example, constitutional democracy? This is the question. As simple as it sounds, this is the question. It was the same question in the Middle Ages, which is, you know, are they coming for us? Are we living uh, times of, of peace? Are we living times of more equality? Or are we living, you know, the Middle Age version of authoritarianism? Um, and I think we should continue to ask this question. And this is a question that is, uh, that is uh, I think, uh, central to us today. Now, my own personal answer to this question is that never, I mean, from the perspective of, 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 of Judaism, uh, that whenever you have people combining these four pillars of fascism that I mentioned before, violence and the militarization of politics, fascist lies and propaganda, dictatorship or dictatorial attempts through coup d'etat and, uh, and, and this politics of, xenos of xenophobia, it was never good for the Jews or other minorities. Thank you. Is fascism, is fascism a necessary condition for genocide? Uh, so put differently, even if every fascist state was not genocidal, do you need fascism to end up with genocide? I mean, that, that's an interesting, qu interesting question because, of course, we have genocide without fascism. I mean, so we have genocide without fascism, right? And yet, when fascism is in power, it becomes quite genocidal in most cases. I mean, uh, or let's say, or engages in, in mass killings. So, I mean, we, the most famous cases of fascism in power, uh, you know, Germany, Italy, but also Spain, suffer, you know, different forms of mass killings. Uh, uh, including genocide. I mean, it, Italy, and this is interesting, I mean, I mentioned before this myth of Italy being different. Uh, and, and Italy, in fact, like in, in Northern Africa and in Ethiopia, engaged in genocidal policies, including using chemical weapons against, against their victims. Uh, but this is kind of under, or it used to be under study. Now, now many people are working on this. So, I mean, let me put it this way. When, when you have a fascist regime, uh, when you had a fascist regime, I'm talking about the past, uh, genocide was always like a, a, you know, a, potential, a potential situation and eventually became one. Uh, I mean, in, in, the, in, in Eastern Europe, what you had is, uh, you know, because fascism can come to power in three different ways, just to simplify it. Or it, let me put it, let me rephrase more historically. Fascism came to power in three different ways, by destroying democracy from within to create a, the, the dictatorship from above, Italy and Germany by civil war, Sp uh, coup d'etat and civil war, Spain, but also by Nazis occupying your country and putting fascists in charge. And that's what happened in so many European countries and they all collaborated in the Holocaust in this kind of pan-European genocidal project. So, yeah, there is a connection there. Uh, I think the next question is one that um, is important for all of us. Uh, do you think fascism will rise in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years? I assume the, the person who asked the question is referring to the United States. I mean, this is, I mean, again, this returns us to the question of what is new and what is not. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have been suggesting some of this in my previous two books, and I'm now writing this book, in which is going to be entitled The Wannabe Fascist. People that are the wannabe fascists, people that aspire to fascism, but are not there yet, and hopefully they will never be there. I mean, because this is another dimension of fascism, that it happens when we let them. That's important to remember. So they, they, they just don't win because, you know, uh, they are alone. They win when, uh, you know, uh, we don't, people, society no longer cares about democracy much when institutions of the state side with the wannabe fascist dictator rather than with the constitution and so on and so forth. So you can basically say these people are close to fascism, that's what I say, but they are not there yet. Because think about Bolsonaro, just to be more diplomatic. Let's focus on Brazil for a second. But you, or think about Trump, it's the same. Yeah. 
they were very similar. I mean, I, I'm not that diplomatic in my books. I mean, Trump and Bolsonaro are all over the place here. So, uh, but uh, think about the four dimensions, the four pillars of fascism. Lies, check. Violence and the militarization of politics is there. It's not necessarily as extreme as it was, but it's close. Uh, lie, lies there, yes. Uh, xenophobia and, and politics of hatred, and you know, the, it's there. They used to, I mean, this is interesting, that I call them populists, this new populism that, that kind of, let me put it this way, it kind of goes back to these elements that were rejected by earlier populists, people like Perón, as I mentioned before, because they go back. They no longer consider these things to be toxic. I mean, Perón will never have had a, a, a fascist antisemite for dinner, or at least not openly, not openly like this. I mean, because that's a problem. Politically, it's a problem. You don't want to show that you are having dinner with Nazis. Um, so, but now it's no longer the case. I mean, that, you know, from Orban to Bolsonaro to, uh, I mean, in Brazil, like the, the, I think it was the Secretary of Culture, that he was plagiarizing a speech by Goebbels. He's talking, and some, and some scholar said, wait, that's, Goebbels was saying this. And then he said, oh, I found it in, in the internet. I didn't know it was Goebbels. Like, uh, so the, the point is that, the, the point is that uh, the last category, I, I four, four pillars, right? The last one is dictatorship. That populism famously rejected dictatorship to engage in, in, you know, uh, in democracy. And whenever they lost, they didn't like the results, but they respected them. And I can tell you many cases, uh, including a very authoritarian leader, Hugo Chavez, who, when he lost, he didn't like it. I mean, a reform that he wanted to do, and then he called for elections again. And uh, so this is new. The fact that this uh, pop populist, uh, I mean, return to all these elements, but also do not recognize electoral results, and also at least some, you know, some part of their constellation participate in coup d'etat. I mean, it's close enough that I call them wannabe fascists. But the question is, will they become fascists? I hope not, and we will not allow them. I mean, I hope we will not allow them. But, but, the, but the point is that once, I mean, the only way, in my opinion, to answer that question, like historically, is, okay, when finally you have a Bolsonaro or a Trump, uh, you know, as a, per, as a let's say, uh, as being the president without, or actually in, 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 uh, opposing electoral results, we call that dictatorship, permanent power without elections or without electoral results. So that we were close. So let's put it this way. How close? I mean, it's a matter of debate, but we were close and this is new. So this is the new, the, like the age of Trump and so on. Yes, this is new. Generally in the US, you don't have coup d'etat. I mean, we used to have a lot of them in my own country, in Argentina. But in the US, this is new stuff. And, and uh, in my opinion, let me put it this way. Had they succeeded, Bolsonaro and Trump, we should talk about fascism, no longer populism. I'm still talking about populism because they are not there yet. I hope they are never there. But I, you know, they return to key elements of fascism. I call them wannabe fascists. That's the title of my next book, which I have to finish, actually. Yeah. Uh, somebody else asked, um, and this is very fitting to what you were just talking about, uh, might there be a possible fifth pillar? And this person is referring to the ties between corporations and the state. Uh, for example, during Nazi Germany, IG Farben and the Krupps. I mean, there are many dimensions of fascism. Like in my book, I mean, I wanted to, you know, to, to bring it down to four, uh, because I think these, these are the, you know, you know, central. But in, in my book, I talk about different dimensions of fascism. Uh, and yet, I don't think one, I mean, you know, in the 1930s, there was uh, corporatism, this idea, that, uh, this idea that corporations are central to the economy and politics. And in the 1970s, people, I mean, in my country that were close to fascism, were, they had none of that. So I don't think the economic dimension is the one that, that really cuts into what fascism is about. Because you can, you can see certain, let's say, uh, economic policies in the 19, in the 19 uh, 30s or 40s, and very different econ economic policies in the 1970s, people close to this. Now, if the question is about links with, uh, you know, uh, links with capital, I mean, in that sense, or I don't think that is specific enough for fascism. There are many, many situations like that. So I, you know, this of course returns to a famous definition of fascism, 
by, by, by uh, the Communist International. Uh, we said, well, what is fascism? But it's the, you know, it's the last radical expression of capitalism, of financial capitalism. And I, I mean, I don't buy that because it's, you know, many regimes can be that. I mean, it's not, you don't need to be fascist to, to you know, to, to, to identify with those kind of politics. And uh, so it's not specific enough. Uh, so, but it's part of the explanation, of course. Another question is, uh, what is the role uh, in fascism of attacks on labor, unions, communists, socialists? I mean, it's, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I, I would will, I will like to focus on the way, I mean, uh, a really great historian of, of, of fascism, which was the late Zeb Sternhel, an Israeli historian, who said that, I mean, Sternhel said that what is central to fascism is that it incorporates and, you know, incorporates uh, slogans and ideas that come both from right and left in order to create an extreme right, right version of the right. But it's interesting because they borrow slogans and they empty them of meaning and they create something else. Let's not forget, uh, this is another lie, that the Nazis call themselves, na uh, uh, you know, National Socialist Party and of socialism they have nothing, nothing. It was, it was at war, they hated socialism. Now, what Stengel says is that they took the idea of socialism, but replaced, it, replaced the idea of, let's say, of uh, social inequality, they kind of replaced it with an idea of national inequality. So they used that kind of vocabulary to talk about nations which were proletarian and nations which were, uh, you know, plutocratic, so to speak. But in a way, they really didn't care about social inequality. So that's, there is nothing, nothing, uh, uh, there is no social dimension there. I mean, but they use that. And from nationalism, of course, we know what they took. So Sternhel says, said, I mean, in one of his famous books, neither uh, 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 right nor left, that it was a combination. It was a right-wing combination of elements that came from the left and elements that came from the right. But that doesn't mean that it was leftist. I mean, le the left was the enemy. I mean, Mussolini, when he was, uh, you know, in his younger years, he was a, a leader in the Socialist Party. Once he became a fascist, one of his main aim was to, you know, persecute socialists. He hated them. Anyway, so this is, this is uh, you know, there are connections, but the connections are ones of hatred and rejection in that sense. And that brings us to the final question. Uh, what is the primary message you want the audience to walk away with today? That, I mean, that, you know, going back to, I mean, again, going back to these questions that, that we asked in the beginning, right, like what's going on and what is new, that we should certainly separate the, the past from the present, but not so much because we should be concerned about the present and, and the future in ways that were matters of concern to many people that then we read, Primo Levi, Hannah Arendt and many others. So I think we cannot forget these histories because sadly many of these histories are connected to our present and, and hope, hopefully not to our futures, but that's our work, right? So basically, I mean, it's important that we should not forget, I, I don't think we should forget that fascism succeeded when society ignored the peril, when society, uh, many members of society did not care about uh, liberal democracy. And again, and this is important, when important part, uh, uh, dimensions of the state identify uh, with the dictator. Um, Anyway, so that's. Thank you. Please join me all in thanking Thank Federico Finkelstein. <laughs>